Welcome to Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God podcast, an in-depth study of the Word of God. The program's name is from Romans 12, 2, which says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Welcome and welcome back to Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God podcast, where we are taking a verse-by-verse chapter by chapter look at the word of God which can only be found in the Bible and we are still in the book of John and we're continuing our study of chapter 19 out of the book of John and this episode we will cover the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in our last episode we started chapter 19 of the book of John, and we cover verses 1 through, I believe it was 15, where we saw Pilate, that was the Roman governor during that time, he was over the greater Jerusalem area, was convinced that Jesus was not guilty of anything, and he was correct. But to appease the Jewish leader and the mob that they had gathered, Pilate had Jesus beaten, He was humiliated when the soldiers slapped him around, put a put a crown made out of sharp thorns on his head, which pierced his head. He was at this point bloody from head to toe from the what's many translation describe as the scourge where they whipped him with a whip that had rocks and bones and nails at the end of his tails. So when the soldier would hit Jesus, those items would dig in into the skin. And so when the soldier would withdraw the whip, Jesus' pieces of Jesus' flesh would be ripped off in the process. And we saw in the last time that Pilate did all this in an effort to hopefully convince the Jewish leaders that that was enough, that he had been punished enough. He had been beaten, he had been humiliated, and that and he was hoping that would be enough for the religious leaders and the mob that they had gathered demanding Jesus's crucifixion but that was not enough they continued to demand to demand that Jesus be crucified which was a gruesome way to die as a person would have nails nailed through their hands and their feet and they and they would hang on that cross for days in agony and pain and be exposed to the element because usually they were naked. And eventually they would die of suffocation where the body could not raise the diaphragm due, due to being nailed to the cross. And eventually the person on the cross would die of suffocation. So as you can imagine, that was a horrible way for Jesus to die. But he did it for me and he did it for you. And we thank him. But going through that agonizing death for our sins, for my sins. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we ended the last episode where Pilate finally ordered the crucifixion of Jesus in order to keep the peace. And so we're going to pick it up in verse 16 of this episode. And we're actually going to see and look at the details of Jesus' brutal death that he did for me and did for you. So in our usual sense, what we'll do, we're going to read verses 16 through 30, and then we're going to come back and break them down individually. So if you have not already done so, I encourage you to open your Bible or your Bible app and read along with me. It's always good to read the word of God. All right, verse number 16 out of John chapter 19. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Verse number 19. 
Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Arabic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Verse number 22, Pilate answered, what have I written? I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Verse number 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Verse number 28. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hospice plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And finally, verse 30, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, as always, we just are thankful. We're thankful that you're our God that you would love us so much that you would send your only begotten son to die for our sins. And I appreciate it and I love you and thank you for it. Lord, as we study your word, we ask, as we always do by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would open up our ears, our hearts, our minds to better understand your word, Father, and apply it in our lives. For you and you alone will get the glory. We give you glory, we give you honor, we thank you for this time to study your word. In your son's holy name. Amen. All right, so now let's go back and pick it up in verse number 16, which is that says, Then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away. And this is pretty much self explanatory. After Pilate, as we saw in our last episode, ordered Jesus to be crucified, he handed him over to the soldiers that would carry out the execution. Moving on to verse number 17. Carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place called the Place of Skull, in Hebrew, Gagaltha. Jesus is most likely not carrying the lowercase t-shaped cross that he's often depicted as carrying. The Romans usually had the vertical post already permanently fixed in the ground. So Jesus and the other people that would be crucified would just carry the t-part. And the reason why they did this, it made it faster and easier to place the victim on the cross. Most victims were forced to transport the horizontal beam, the beam that went across the vertical beam to make the T. And Jesus conditioned from being beaten, slapped around, a thorn, a crown of thorn piercing his head, most likely would not have been in a position to carry a full wooden cross through the city to the place of the skull. John does not give us this detail that I'm going to tell you, but the other Gospels and Matthew and Mark and Luke, the executioners became impatient with Jesus and actually forced a bystander to carry the beam. A man 
named Simon from Cyrene. So Jesus was in such bad shape, he couldn't even carry the beam that he was supposed to carry. And the Romans, realizing this, pulled a man out of the crowd and made this man, Serene, Simon from Serene, carry it for him. Forcing the condemned to walk along a public road, bringing their own tool of execution was cruel. And that was intentional because the Romans want to send a message with these displays of these cruelties and the crucifixion itself to make it shameful, embarrassing, and humiliating as possible to send a message to all those don't cross the Roman system or this could be you. And no one wanted to be crucified. And so that's how they kept them in line or one way they kept them in line. Moving on to verse number 18 out of chapter 19 of the book of John. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. The crucifixion victims could be nailed through the palm of their hands, but the more common location was just above the wrist between the bones of the forearm. The wide-headed spikes that were used was slightly thinner than a finger about the length of a hand would pierce a major nerve resulting in constant agony. And that was the goal. They, they did this. They selected the place where they nailed people's hands and feet on purpose because they wanted this death to be painful and excruciating. So with the, so with the method I just described, they would avoid major blood vessels prolonging the pain and providing enough support for the weight of the body because again the body had to support itself while it was on that cross and so all this was intentional and when it came to the putting the nails and the feet what they would do is drive the nails or nail through a major nerve avoiding major blood vessels so a person wouldn't bleed out to death but it would be painful allowing the weight to hang on those feet. Can you imagine that? You have a nail through your feet and the weight of your body is hanging on that nail. Most victims were, mailed, were nailed slightly bent legs and widespread arms. So you'll see instead of them having, instead of the person to be straight vertical, you'll see a slight bend at the knees while their arms are spread out wide. A normal crucifixion posture left the victim's weight hanging by those two wrists, pulling the chest wide and making it hard to breathe outwards. Again, when I said in the beginning that ultimately what killed the person was suffocation because the body could no longer support itself the way they were hung in order to breathe properly, the victim had to pull against the wrist that had the nails in it or push against the foot that had nails. Using the legs was much easier, but both were brutally painful. Because can you imagine, either way, you're trying to do something that's abnormal as far as breathing. And once they had the victims up, they would hang exposed to the weather wild animals, infection from the nailing, thirst, and constant agony. And the exposure they was talking about to the weather is, as I alluded to earlier, oftentimes they, this was done and the victims were naked. So most likely when Jesus went through this horrifying death, he didn't have any clothes on, like most people who went through it. And that was intentional because they wanted this thing to be humiliating and embarrassing and, and agonizing, and it was. And eventually, one or all of these things, the exposure to the weather, the wild animals, the infection, the thirst, the pain, would cause the death. But most commonly what caused the death was the struggle to breathe and the loss of the ability to lift oneself against the nails, and thus you would slowly suffocate, as you could not do that in order to breathe. And this could take several days after which the body was often left 
to rot as a public spectacle. So once these individuals died, they left them up there. Because again, the Romans want to send a message. This could be you if you break our laws. And the message was sent. Moving on to verse number 19. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Most likely the, this was Pilate being sarcastic because he didn't believe that these Jewish leaders who bought, brought Jesus to them was their king. But that was the purpose. That's what they said he was in order to say he was going to lead a sedition or rebellion against the Roman Empire. And so that's why he was being sarcastic. And so when they asked him to change it, he said he would not. Because he was upset that these Jewish leaders, along with the mob, made him go against something that he knew was wrong. He knew Jesus was innocent. But because of the situation which he was in, where he may have been doing this Passover with all these people in Jerusalem, he didn't want to risk a riot, so he appeased the religious leader and the mob they put together and ordered Jesus crucified. But he was not going to change what he wrote because, again, he's not trying to do any favors for the Jewish leaders. Moving on to verse number 20. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek so that many people could read it. So in a symbolic sense, Jesus' crucifixion and his kingship was already being proclaimed to the entire world because those were the major languages of the world, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And there they were proclaiming the truth that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Verse number 21. Then the leading priests objected and said to Pilate, change it from the king of the Jews to he said, I am king of the Jews. Jesus' enemies do not acknowledge him as their king in any shape or form. For that reason, they objected to Pilate labeling Jesus' cross with the title king of the Jews. The Jewish leaders would prefer Pilate change the inscription to match their criticism of Jesus, that he is not, in fact, Israel's king. Moving on to verse number 22 of John chapter 19. Pilate replied, no, what I have written, I have written. Now that the crowd has gotten what they want, however, Pilate is not going to budge on something like this inscription. Again, he declared that Jesus had not done anything. He was not guilty of anything. But to appease the, loot, the Jewish leaders in the crowd, he gave in and ordered Jesus executed. But that was going to be it. He's not going to do anything else for these individuals, especially something in his mind as small as semantics of he is the king of the Jews as opposed to he said he's the king of the Jews. Verse number 23, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Victims of crucifixions were normally stripped naked, as we talked about before. And that was a mark of shame and also to increase their exposure to the elements, the weather, as they were on that cross. So soldiers anticipated as a fringe benefit of being an executioner, they would get the clothes of the victims because, again, during those times, everything was scarce. That made everything valuable. They didn't have clothing stores where you can just go and pick out a, a number of clothes off the rack. So when they had an opportunity to get these clothes, that was good for them because, again, there was a lot of poverty during that time. People did not have readily jobs available to them. So it was hard to come by food. It was hard to come by uh, clothing. And so they knew these individuals who was going to be executed or crucified, their clothes were going to be taken. They just weren't going to throw them away. They would divide the clothes among themselves, and they did that with Jesus Moving on to verse number 24. So they said, rather than tear it apart, let's throw dice for it, or a lot, some translation says. This fulfilled the scripture that says, they divided my garment among themselves and threw dice for my clothing. So that is what they did. In Jesus' case, 
there were five articles of clothing that was divided. Probably some kind of head cover, some sandals, a cloak, and a belt. But he also had an undergarment, a tunic, that was in one piece. And rather than rip the fabric apart, the four men gambled to see who would get this, that piece of Jesus' clothing. Now, the other Gospels note, it was around this time when Jesus expressed forgiveness toward these men who had crucified him. You can find that in Luke, verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothing by throwing the dice. John, also known as the one Jesus has loved, has been brave enough to come close to the cross during this time where he would have seen firsthand these soldiers gambling for Jesus' clothes. So John saw this with his own eyes because he was there. Now, many of the disciples was there. They, many of them were scared and they got in the wind, but John was there, and he was able to see these soldiers gambling for Jesus' clothes. John also notes how some chapter 22, verse 18, was fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots, was being fulfilled, which depict Jesus suffering at the hands of his enemies. So John denotes Psalm 22, 18 being fulfilled when he saw those soldiers gambling with Jesus' clothing. Moving on, we're going to take verses 25, 26, and 27 together because they flow together and for continuity's sake. Verse number 25. Standing near the cross was Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Verse number 26. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. Then verse number 27. And he said to this disciple, here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. Very few of Jesus' disciples were present or doing or around his crucifixion. But as we already have seen, John was one of the few that was there, along with some women. And we see in these verses, Jesus' mother was there. Jesus' mother's sister was there. And Mary, Mary Magdalene was there. In the ancient world, elderly people depended entirely on their family for support in their old age. So by telling John to see Mary as his own mother, Jesus is ensuring that Mary would be cared for. So in other words, he was telling Mary and telling John, John is going to take care of you. That's what he was doing. Now let's look at Jesus' death. Verse number 28, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. John skips over most of Jesus' statements from the cross. So in other words, we would learn from other gospels that Jesus said other things from the cross other than I am thirsty. Here he records, here in verse number 28, John records another fulfillment of scripture that comes just before Jesus finally dies. Here, John notes a parallel between the suffering described in Psalms 29, 21, excuse me, 69, 21, which says, they gave me poison for food, and from my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. And that was referencing Jesus at this moment that he's going through now. And so we see in verse number 29, a jar of sour wine was sitting there. So they soaked a sponge on it, putting on a hospice branch and held it up to his lips. What John's described here as sour wine may be vinegar mixed with water. And that's what they gave Jesus to drink. After he said he was thirsty, again fulfilling Psalms chapter 69, verse number 21. And then finally, verse number 30. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Many Bible scholars believe Jesus asked 
for something to drink so he would be able to say, it is finished, because his lips and tongue were probably dried out from the loss of bodily fluid. Because again, he's gone through a beating. He's gone through nails being placed in his hands and feet. And so he's gone through a lot for us. But what we have to focus on is what he did. That which Jesus was sent to accomplish, that's what he did, to atone on that cross for the sins of mankind, for my sins, for your sins. And he did it entirely and fully and completely in that moment. And thus, he said, it was finished. Amen and hallelujah to that. No further work needs to be done, nor can it be done. So there's no room for any human actions to add on to the cross. There's no rituals we can do, no sacraments, no payments to accomplish salvation. Jesus paid it and did it all on that cross. And the fact that Jesus said he gave up his spirit is significant. His death was entirely an act of his own free will. They couldn't take his life. He gave it up. As that scripture said, he gave up the spirit. He gave up his life for me, for you, and for all the sins of mankind. Aren't you grateful he did that? I know I am. I'm grateful that he took my place on that cross. I'm grateful that he died for my many, many, many sins. I hope you are too. And because of that, you can have everlasting life if you confess that Jesus died for your sins. And if that's you and you're listening to this right now, you've never made a public declaration or what you feel in your heart. You're now saying you listen to this. You may have listened to other, others teach on the word of God. And you say, hey, I believe that. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Now is your time to make that public declaration. Confess what's in your heart. That you're a sinner in need of a savior. And that savior is Jesus Christ. And that he died for you. And if that's you, sir, madam, boy, girl, do it right now. Because tomorrow is not promised to us. And if that's you, just simply say, I believe, Father God, and I know I'm a sinner. And I believe you sent your only begotten son, Jesus, to die for my sins. Father God, in Jesus' name, forgive my sins. Jesus, you're now my Lord and my Savior in your name. Amen. And as simple as that. The gospel, especially the gospel of salvation, is simple because God wanted everybody to get it. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to have a Ph.D. You don't have to have a college degree. You don't have to have a high school degree. You don't even have to know how to read. Someone could be teaching you the word of God, and you don't even know how to read it and believe in it and be saved. That's how simple it is. That's just how simple it is because he wanted everybody to have an opportunity, regardless of your station in life. To confess Jesus as Lord, and that's all, it's, that's all it is. And if you did that, welcome to God's family. You now have eternal life. You are a new creature in Christ. You are, because you now have a new spirit that was born again by the power of the Holy Spirit that now lives in you. You have reconciliation with God the Father. You are now part of his godly family. That's, these things are wonderful. And while salvation is not a feeling, you should be happy. But your happiness and your feelings, one way or the other, does not give you salvation. Confessing what you have in your heart that Jesus died for you and you believing that. That's what saves you. That's what his word says saves you. And if that's you, congratulations. And thank God for you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. We pray that this Bible study has blessed you. If you have a prayer request, you can email it to renewyourmindm at gmail.com or mail it to P.O. Box 721143, Jackson, Mississippi 39272. Remember, 
You can hear current and past episodes at any time on our website of RenewYourMindMinistries.org or on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Alexa, Audible, and Google Podcasts. We encourage you to tell others about the program and share our website of RenewYourMindMinistries.org. Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. By telling others about the program, you are doing your part to spread the gospel into all the world about our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Until next time, this has been Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God.